Lesson 9 has several parts. The first part is on absolute value. And just thinking of absolute value as a distance. For example, let's just think if we had this point, minus 3, comma, 0. We wanted to graph that. It would be 3 to the left on the x-axis be right here. So that would be at minus 3, comma, 0. Now, if we wanted to think about the distance from the origin, this distance here, we would say that's a distance of 3. We wouldn't say it's a distance of minus 3. Just looking at the length involved there, or the distance involved there, we would say that is 3. So that's what absolute value is about. Absolute value, you can understand it by thinking about a distance. Now, look at this problem that I have there. I want you to graph x. The x is a set. x is a member of the set of real numbers such that the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 5. I want you to graph that on a number line. You don't graph this on a Cartesian coordinate system. You just graph it on a, a single x axis. That's what a number line is. So what we're doing is we're going to find all the values of x that are real numbers such that any of those substituted in for absolute value of x minus 2, that will give us a distance less than 5. If we think about absolute value as a distance, what values would be less than 5? Or what values would make that relationship have a distance less than 5? So think about this for a second. What would make the absolute value of x minus 2 greater than 5. If we put an 8 in there for x, we'd have 8 minus 2 is 6. 6 is not less than 5. 7 minus 2, that would be equal to 5. So right at 7, we could put an open circle. So let's just say this is 7 over here, and we'll put an open circle there, because that means we're not including 7. We're looking at numbers just barely less than 7. This has a calculus application here. Remember, when we think about calculus, we think about instantaneous rates of change, really, really, really tiny little rates of change. So just a little, little tiny bit to the left of 7 is where we can start making our representation of this set. And so what we can do is just go ahead and start shading in where it's 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, that's a distance there of 5, isn't it? We've gone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units. So we can shade that region in right there. And this is 2 right here, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now think about absolute value. Think about that as a distance. We need also a distance of 5 to the left of this as well. So that would be 2 minus 5, so we'd have to go to 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2, and need to add one more tick mark there, say minus 3. So now we have a distance of 5 to the left as well. Open circle there at minus 3. If we put minus 3 into that absolute value of x minus 2, we'd end up with minus 3 minus 2 is minus 5, but the absolute value of that is equal to 5. So we put an open circle there because just a little, little tiny bit to the right, we would have absolute value of that less than 5. Another way to think about this is x is going to be a member of the set of real numbers such that all of those values are a distance of 5 or less, a distance less than 5 from x minus 2. Another way to think about this is just look at that x minus 2 less than 5. Don't worry about the absolute value right now. And just solve that. You add 2 to both sides and you'd say x less than 7. So just like we saw here, we put an open circle at 7. We knew that x had to be less than 7. But when you're dealing with absolute value, you have to think about the negative side as well. And you say x minus 2 greater than negative 5. You make opposites, basically. You have opposite inequality symbol, opposite number on the right. 
and add 2 to both sides here, and we'd have x greater than negative 3. And so that's just like what we saw there, just solving it in terms of algebraic concepts instead. Let's go ahead and look at this problem. It says graph x is a member of the set of integers such that the absolute value is greater than 8. So let's just solve this one algebraically. That's the best way to do these to, to eliminate mistakes anyway, is just think about without the absolute value sign, you'd have 3x minus 1 is greater than 8. Add 1 to both sides, and you'd have 3x greater than 9x is greater than 3. So we know that part of our number line, it's going to be x values greater than 3. That would give us an absolute value greater than 8. Now we also need to consider negative numbers as well, and we do that by just saying 3x minus 1, that relationship inside the absolute value sign, switch the inequality, change the sign on the right to negative 8, and now just solve this algebraically, 3x less than a negative 7, x less than negative 7 thirds. So values of x that are greater than 3, as well as values of x that are less than negative 7 thirds, those will give us absolute values greater than 8. Let's go ahead and graph this. Keeping in mind that we're graphing the set of integers, so we're not graphing all of the real numbers. We're just graphing integers here. So we'll just put 0 right here. I'll just label every other one. And we know that we're graphing x greater than 3. So we don't put an open circle on 3 because we're dealing with integers. The next integer greater than 3 would be a 4. So we just put a dot at 4, a dot at 5. We shade in the arrow to represent that we'd be continuing on with integers to the right. Now we go and do the other part of this relationship, x less than negative 7 thirds. Well, negative 7 thirds is like saying negative 2 and 1 thirds. So the next integer less than that would be a negative 3. So we put a dot there, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, shade in the arrow. So we have graphed the set of integers that make that absolute value statement true. x values greater than 3, integer x values greater than 3. That's why we started at 4 and not at 3. If it was greater than or equal to 3, then we could start at 3, but it's greater than. So the next integer greater than 3 is a 4. And then less than negative 2 and 1 thirds, so we would start at negative 3. All of those integer values make that relationship true. Part B of this lesson is on special functions, and it's just some things to think about when you're working with functions. When we're thinking about functions, always remember that you can graph those on a coordinate system, a Cartesian coordinate system. The Cartesian coordinate system is the place where we combine geometry and algebra together. We represent some geometric pattern, whether it's a circle, a line, a curve, we represent that algebraically on the Cartesian coordinate plane. So look at A. I want you to graph that function. Y equals the absolute value of X minus 2. And so we can just go ahead and make a Cartesian coordinate plane. And what you ought to do is, well, you don't have to do it this way, but it helps to understand it, to think about that without the absolute value sign. And if we thought about it, y equals x minus 2, just like that, we could see that's an equation of a line that has a y-intercept of negative 2 and a slope of 1. So we could go from that negative 2 point, go up 1, over 1, put a dot, up 1, over 1 again, put a dot, and that's plenty of dots to show the pattern of that line. Now that is y equals x minus 2. That's not y equals the absolute value of x minus 2. 
think about it, the absolute value is always going to be positive, isn't it? So think about it. All of that negative part of the graph, everything below the x-axis, in other words, that's not really going to be part of this actual graph. When x is 0, we would have y equals absolute value of negative 2, which is just 2. When x is 0, y is actually a positive 2. So the graph looks like this, looks like a V. All absolute values of functions, they will always, when you graph them, be above the x-axis. They may touch the x-axis because they can equal zero, but they'll always be above it for sure. Unless, of course, you had a negative sign in front of it, all in front of the absolute value symbol like that. If this was y equals minus the absolute value of x minus 2, that would just be like this. That would always be negative. Now we have some other absolute value functions there, but b, let's go ahead and look at b. b is not an absolute value function. That's called the greatest integer function. See, it's got braces there. It doesn't have just the bars on the sides like absolute value. But let's go ahead and graph that, and we'll just make our Cartesian coordinate system like we always do. y always equals the greatest integer that is less than or equal to x. So think about, just start at 0. When x equals 0, y equals 0. When x equals like half, y would still equal 0. So we kind of have a little line segment. And then when we get to like 0.9 or 9 tenths, y still equals 0. But when we get to 1, we have to put an open circle there and jump up to 1. Because y is always going to be the greatest integer that's less than or equal to x. So when x equals 1, y will also equal 1, and it will continue to equal 1 until you get to 2. So you put an open circle there, then a closed circle up at 2. Do the same thing. Open circle at 3, then you go up to 3. Open circle at 4, up to 5 and so on. And then we need to put a closed circle there at 0, representing that when x equals 0, y equals 0. And then we would need an open circle at negative 1 there. A closed circle like that. So think about negative 1. When we're at negative 0.5, the greatest integer that's less than or equal to that would be negative 1 because negative 1 is less than a negative 0.5. That's why y stays at negative 1 until we get to 0. Then we jump up because 0 is another integer. We can continue this pattern in the negative direction as well. You might want to put this function in your formula book because it's one that you don't use a whole lot and just remember that basic pattern that we have right there. You might be asked to graph something like this, greatest integer x plus 3. Just remember in these problems when you have like a plus 3, like greatest integer of x, that's our standard function, and then if you had a plus 3 like that, that basically means it's going to be shifted to the left 3. The whole pattern will be shifted to the left 3. Just like in practice problem A, if you thought about just the absolute value of x, you'd have that v-shape going through the origin. But we had x minus 2, so that means it was shifted to the right 2. Let's go ahead and do another problem. y equals absolute value of cosine x. And so here we'll be doing a sinusoid pattern, but it's the absolute value of cosine of x. Let's just go ahead and think about how we graph a sinusoid pattern. We have a plus 1 and a minus 1. And let's put some angles down every 90 degrees. And we'll go ahead and label 90, 270 there, minus 90, minus 270 there. 
Now think about cosine when theta, or, or x in this case, is equal to 0 degrees. Cosine of 0 is 1. So we'll start this graph up at positive 1. And let's start going down to 90. At cosine 90, that would be 0 degrees. Now normally we would go down underneath, but we know it's the absolute value. So actually what's going to happen is we'll go back up again. And we just make a series of bumps, basically. Looks like a bouncing ball. That is the graph of the absolute value of cosine of x. We remember what we learned there in A, that we always just have positive values for y when we're doing an absolute value function. Unless, of course, the whole thing is multiplied by a negative on the outside. Then it makes everything negative. But in this case, everything is positive. All the y values will be positive. Let's go ahead and look at problem D now. And it says y equals absolute value of x squared minus 2x minus 3. So hopefully you can recognize there that you'd be graphing a parabola. It's the absolute value of that parabola. So think about it. All the values for it must be positive. Let's just kind of think about the shape of this parabola a little bit. And we could think about the y-intercept when x equals 0, y equals negative 3. So that would be down here. That's a negative value. We know that we can't have negative values for the parabola. It's going to have to all be positive. So the vertex is going to be down in a negative y value. The vertex will be down below. The best thing we ought to do on a problem like this is find the x-intercepts. Just think about this. I'll just draw a little coordinate system over here to the side. If we had a parabola that had a vertex below the x-axis like that, but we were really wanting to do the absolute value function, what's going to happen is that nothing will be below the x-axis and we'll have a bump that goes like that instead. That's what our function is going to end up looking like. So it's real important that we find those x-intercepts. Most of these problems that you'll do like this, they're designed to factor easily into two binomials. So just look at the x squared minus 2x minus 3, that quadratic relationship, and just think about that. That would be x minus 3 times x plus 1. Set that equal to y. And so your x-intercepts, the times when y would equal 0 would be at x equals positive 3, which would be over here, and x equals negative 1, right there. Those are the x-intercepts. Now, we can also think about another point here. We know that when x equals 0, y equals negative 3, but the absolute value of that would be a positive 3. So it's really going to be up here instead of that green negative 3 point that we had drawn. Now that's, that's enough information to help us figure out how to draw this. We can just go ahead and make a hump like that and then we know it'll curve up like that on the sides. We could do completing the square on this to find the vertex. And the vertex would just basically be in an opposite position from what it is because of the absolute value. Just try to keep in mind, though, when you do absolute value functions, everything has to be above the x-axis. Parabolas, finding those x-intercept points, places where it would normally cross the x-axis, those are important points to find to help you graph it. Let's do one more. This is called a piecewise function, and you have different parts that you have to consider. So here we want to graph the function g of x when it's equal to the square root of x minus 1 for x greater than 1 and minus the square root of minus x plus 1 for values of x less than 1. So let's just think about that. Think about just the square root of x. Maybe you remember how to graph just the square root of x. That has a shape like that. So this will have a similar shape. It'll just be shifted a little bit. 
shifted to the right one, in fact, won't it? And graph the square root of x minus 1 for x greater than 1. If x was equal to 1, then we'd have square root of 1 minus 1 or 0. But it's greater than 1, so at 1 we need to put an open circle and values greater than that, it will curve up from there. Now think about our other relationship here for m square root of minus x plus 1. That's really the same thing as saying minus times minus x minus 1. So it's just like the opposite of the other one. The other first function was square root of x minus 1. This one is minus x minus 1. So not for x equals 1, just really, really close to that, though. We have less than 1. If it was equal to 1, we'd have 1 minus 1 is 0. So that would be the square root of 0. Negative times 0 is just 0. Let's do something less than 1, like a half. If x was equal to a half, then we'd have minus half plus 1 would be a positive half. Square root of that, we'd end up with minus the square root of a half. So basically what we do is have a reflection and rotation of that function that we sketched already, the square root function. And so it'll just curve like that we'd have what's called a hole. We'd say there's a hole in the function at 1 comma 0. Because this piecewise function that we have doesn't give us any information about equal to 1, just greater than or less than 1. So that would be the appropriate way to graph that. We'd say there's a hole at 1 comma 0. Open circles are important in calculus. That means we get really, really, really close to that value, but we never equal that particular value. That's what calculus is about, dealing with instantaneous changes in rates. So in order to have an instantaneous change, that means we're dealing with just a really, really, really small change. It's not quite zero that we're talking about, but it's close. Part C of this lesson is about the logarithmic form of the exponential. Now, if you did the Dive Advanced Math CD, you know that I talked about logarithm means exponent. I probably said that hundreds of times. Because sometimes logarithms can be a little confusing, but that's really what you're doing. If you had a number n, you could write that with a base b and an exponent l. The logarithmic form is log base b of that argument n equals l, the exponent. Now in the early 1600s, John Napier, a Christian man, he invented logarithms as a way to work with really, really big and really, really small numbers. Back then they didn't have calculators and paper wasn't just super abundant either. And so having an easy way to work with really large and really small numbers was very helpful. And that's what logarithms did. Instead of talking about the number all the time and writing the whole number out, you would just write out the exponent of it. Now today, the main logarithms we use are ones with a base of e or a base of 10. And that's what part D of this lesson is about. Think about if you had 100. If that was your value for n, you could write that with a base of b to the power of 2, because 100 equals 10 squared. So likewise, log base 10 of 100, that equals 2. Get your calculator out and make sure you can find the logarithm of 100 on your calculator. Just turn it on. If you have a TI-83+, plus, you just hit the log button, L-O-G, type in 100, then hit enter, and you should get 2 for an answer. Now, if you do natural log or ln of 100, you'll get something different. That's like saying log base e of 100, or on your calculator, it's just written ln. And so if you hit the ln button, typed in 100, you will not get 2. You should get 
about 4.6 for an answer because that's the exponent when you have a hundred if you had a base of e or 2.718 the exponent would have to be about 4.6 in order to equal a hundred logarithm means exponent the log that just tells you like log or ln that just tells you that you're finding the exponent for a particular base or in other words finding the exponent of an argument raised to a particular base it's kind of like sine and cosine and tangent you don't say sine times theta or cosine times theta likewise here you're not saying log base 10 times 100 it's just telling you it's a notation to tell you that you're taking the logarithm of 100 you're finding the exponent of 100 when the base is 10 or when you take the natural log of 100 you're finding the exponent of 100 when the base is 2.718 or E let's go ahead and do some practice problems now let's apply what we have learned about logarithm and especially these two formulas right here I want to write these down in your notebook that you're making and apply those to help you solve some problems like look at practice problem a we have a base of 10 raised to x equals 7 we can rewrite that in logarithmic form as log base 10 of 7 equals x so you can do that on your calculator that's the log button on your calculator you just hit log log of 7 type in 7 hit enter and we'll just do that to three decimal places. That would be x equals 0.845. 10 to the 0.845 should equal 7. Now you could check your work on that by using your graphing calculator again. If you have the TI-83+, plus, hit the second button, then hit log again, and you'll see this come up. It'll say like 10 and a little chevron mark and then it'll give you a parentheses so then you enter in point eight four five type in point eight four five there you can close the parentheses off or just hit enter and we rounded our previous answer so it should get us close to seven i got six point nine nine eight as a result for that but that's always a way to check your work you just kind of go backwards you hit second log which gives you the base raised to the exponent and you type in the value for the exponent to give you the argument look at B e to the X equals 3 write that as a logarithm log base e of the argument 3 equals the exponent in this case that's X log base e that's the natural logarithm on your calculator the LN button so you just hit LN 3 and you should get 1.097 so that is equal to 1.097 you can check your work if you want to hit the second natural log and you should get a little e with a chevron mark kind of like you did the 10 with the chevron mark type in 1.097 hit enter and I get 2.995 which is about 3 I rounded that's why you don't get exactly the argument back you get a little bit less because of the rounding logarithm means exponent for an argument n that can equal a base b raised to the power of l raised to that exponent l likewise logarithm base b of n equals l when john napier invented logarithms he made logarithm tables he spent 20 years making these tables of logarithms for a bunch of different numbers fortunately now our calculators can calculate logarithms for any number base 10 and base e logarithms anyway we can't do like a base 3 or a base 5 logarithm on our calculator but we can do base 10 and base e those are the most common ones let's do another problem let's solve log base 4 of 16 equals 3a plus 1 solve that for a now we have a log base 4 there and don't get confused on that and think oh well I can't solve this because I don't I can't do that on my calculator 
think about your relationship log base b of an argument equals the exponent or the argument equals the base raised to the exponent. If we think about that, we can rearrange this problem right here. The argument 16 is equal to the base of 4 raised to the exponent 3a plus 1. Now that still doesn't look like something we can solve, but these problems are designed to get similar bases on both sides of the equal sign. 16 is the same thing as 4 squared, right? A base of 4 to the power of 2 equals 4 to the 3a plus 1. So now, in order for those two things to be equal to each other, the exponents have to be equal. So we can just say 2 is equal to 3a plus 1. Subtract 1 from both sides and we get 1 equals 3a. a equals one third. So we've solved for A in that problem. The only way we could really solve for that was knowing our logarithm rules, our relationship between the logarithmic form and the exponential form. Let's do one more look at practice problem D. If you want to, try to solve that one on your own. It's the same idea here. We want to get this out of the logarithm form and get it in the exponential form. So we have log base b of an argument equals the exponent 2. We can just say the argument 3x plus 4 is equal to the base of x to the power of 2 or x squared. So you should be able to recognize here you have a quadratic relationship x squared x and a constant. Just rewrite this, set it equal to 0 x squared minus 3x minus 4 equals 0. And these problems you'll do in the problem sets, they'll be designed to factor into two whole number binomials. So you don't have to use the quadratic formula to find the roots. And so we'd have x minus 4 and x plus 1. Those two values would work. x therefore is going to be equal to 4 and negative 1. So there's two values of x that will work. You have to be careful though on these problems. You have to substitute back into the original relationship and make sure that's going to work. Log base negative 1. You can't have a negative 1 for a base. You can only have numbers greater than or equal to 1 for bases when you're dealing with logarithms. So x equals 4, that's the only answer you have to cross out, negative 1. That doesn't give you a negative argument either. Neither one of them give you a negative argument, but you just can't have a negative base. That's something else to check as well, is just substitute into the argument, like we'd have 3 times 4 is 12, plus 4, that's 16. The argument can't be negative either, back in the original logarithmic relationship. Something to keep in mind as you solve problems dealing with logarithms. Okay, well that's all for Lesson 9.